Mohamed will present today some concepts, some quantum mechanical concepts for, for quantum mechanics. So for those of you who do not have a physics background or a specifically a quantum physics background, I think this will be a very helpful mentorship session um, so that you can understand better what goes, what's going on, and let's say under the hood when you're, when you're doing quantum computing and why we need quantum computing. So, um, yeah, floor is yours, Mohamed. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks, Nasser. Uh, I'm Mohamed from Constantine Quantum Technologies. So, uh, just to check, uh, uh, I, do you hear me well and do you see the screen? From my end, everything is good. So, everything is good for everyone. Great. Yeah, so, as I said, uh, I'm Mohamed from Constantine Quantum Technologies. Uh, and I will give uh, a small introductory talk about quantum mechanics, uh, the concepts of quantum mechanics that you need to know to do quantum computing. Uh, so uh, we will start with a small disclaimer before we dive into this uh, intriguing world of quantum mechanics. I wanted to let you know that uh, this presentation uh, will take uh, some shortcuts, skip over certain points and use argument that may not be entirely true or complete. Uh, the main goal of this talk is to make quantum mechanics simpler and easier to understand uh, to people uh, with little to no physics background. So by using these shortcuts and occasionally bending the truth, I hope to give you just a taste of the basic of quantum mechanics uh, to, to use in quantum computing without overwhelming you. Uh, obviously, if you want to dig deeper and in a more rigorous way, I encourage you to uh, explore more advanced resources. So without further ado, let's dive into the intriguing world of quantum, uh, the intriguing world of quantum mechanics, the quantum world. So this talk will take the shape of a story, the story of when I visited a school in the quantum world, a school named Q School. So I was working with the principal of this school in the hallway, in the hallways, and uh, the principal told me that uh, in the next classroom uh, there is three chairs and there is a student, and and that uh, the students were sitting on the third chair. Uh, and as I walked by and saw, I confirmed that this was indeed the case. There was uh, one student and he was sitting on the third chair. He said then that in the second classroom, there is one student sitting in the first chair. And again, when I walked by, I saw that it was the case. There was one student sitting in the first chair. Then he said that in the next classroom, there was a student who was sitting in the first and third chairs simultaneously. Uh, and I was intrigued by that. So I went to see, uh, and what I saw was a student sitting in a third chair. Uh, I told the principal that he was wrong. Uh, besides the fact that a student can be sitting across multiple chairs, uh, I see the student sitting on the third chair only. Uh, and the principal answered that indeed right now the student is sitting on one chair only. However, just before my observation, the student uh, the students were sitting across multiple chairs. Uh, I had, uh, and let's say still, honestly, still have a hard time believing that, uh, but the principal should know best the rules of the, the, the school and the rule of the quantum world as he lives there. So let's try to prove him wrong, but to do that, let's first try to understand the complete set of rules governing the Q school and the quantum world in general. So, as of now, we saw kind of two things. Uh, first of all, in the Q school, students can be sitting on multiple chairs simultaneously. Uh, and formally, this is called superposition. Uh, we also saw that, saw that as soon as we observe a classroom, the students uh, stop being in a superposition and sits on one chair only. Uh, the act of observation uh, that we do is called a measurement. So in the quantum world, when we observe, we say that we made a measurement. Uh, before continuing, let's also take a small moment to look at the correct terminology to describe things in the Q school and in the quantum world in a more uh, formal way. So moving on, I will say, I will call a quantum system or system for short, uh, any physical system governed by the principles of quantum mechanics. Uh, the Q school is a system governed by quantum mechanics, but also the classroom, uh, which uh, in particular, I will focus on the classroom as our quantum system. 
the basis states are the complete set of fundamental and separate states of our system. Uh, in, the, in the classroom, the basis states are the chairs. So the first chair is the basis state, the second is also a basis state, the third is also another one. And as a notation, we write the basis state with this notation here, so which is called the cat. So we will say cat zero, cat one, for, for cat zero, for example, to, to talk about the first chair, cat one to talk, to talk about the second chair, and etc. Finally, uh, an L-level system is a system who possesses N basis state. So the classroom that we are presenting are three level systems because they have uh, three basis states, uh, the three chairs. In quantum computing, however, we are generally only interested in, in two level systems. So we can do quantum computing beyond the two level systems, but generally we just stick to two level systems, which we call the qubits. So bits is classically uh, a two level system and qubit is the quantum extension of that. Uh, now let's continue our investigation of the quantum rules in the Q school uh, and let's scary experiment. So when I ask the principal about all the information that he has about the next classroom, he says that in the next classroom, there is two chairs, so two basis states, and thus uh, we are two level system or a qubit, and that there is one sitting sitting across them and that there is a 50% chance of observing the student in the first chair. So the chair, which we call here with this, the cat zero, and 50% of observing him with the, uh, in the first, the second chair, so the chair with cat one. And when I carried the measurements, uh, at first I, I saw the student was sitting on the second chair. Then I stopped measuring and measured back. And what I saw was that the student was still sitting in the first chair. So I repeated this few times, but every time I saw that the student was sitting on the second chair. It looks like the 50-50% chance of measuring the students on the first and second chair uh, that the principal talked about is wrong. When I reported my experimental results to the principal, he said that, uh, in fact, this is normal that in the Q school and in the quantum world, once you make the measurements, you disturb the students and you make him sit on one chair only. So the measurement uh, changes the state of the, uh, the students in some way. Uh, he said that in, in order to observe the superposition really, what I needed is to measure a set of identical classrooms Classrooms in which there is a student with equal probabilities of finding him across the two chairs. So here is an example of, let's say, multiple classrooms which should have the same state. So when I make the measurements of, of the first classroom, uh, second, third, uh, fourth, fifth, and etc., and I gather my results. If I do it for a large number of classrooms, I should be able to find that approximately 50% of the time, I found the student sitting in the first chair, so the chair with state uh, cat zero, and 50% of the time, the other piece. So let's take another moment and record those findings. So in the Q school and, and generally in the quantum world tools, we know that the set of chairs that the student sits on uh, with the corresponding probabilities. So we know, we can know this, or we know it. But however, what we don't know is uh, the precise outcome of a measurement in advance. So we know that there is uh, X chance of finding him in this state, and X chance of finding him in this state. But before carrying the measurement, we cannot be sure uh, in which state we'll find him in. Unless, obviously, he's a uh, 100% uh, Percent, there is 100% chance of finding him in one single state. Uh, what we also know is that repeated measurements yield the same results. This means that the measurements destroys the superposition uh, and the sudden change from a superposition to a single state when you do measurements uh, is called by the quantum people uh, wave collapse. So let's uh, continue. 
Uh, but let's uh, let's try to find the formal slash mathematical way to record the probabilities that the principal uh, is talking about. For that, let's consider the following scenario: a classroom with one student, and uh, in which there is thirty-three percent chance of measuring him in the zero state, so the state with that zero, and sixty-six percent of measuring him in the state uh, one. So thirty-three point three, thirty-three point three. Um, the first, let's say, approach that we can think of is just have a small table or like a column vector in which we write both the probabilities. So we write 33.3 to indicate that there is 33.3% to find him in the uh, first chair. And in the second uh, row in the vector, we write 66% to indicate that there is 66.6% uh, of finding him in the second chair. Um, the principal said that, well, this is a good start, but this is not how, um, this is not quite how people in the quantum world record the state of, of, of the classroom or of system. So people in the quantum world indeed use uh, a column vector like we did, but instead of recording the probabilities, people there write probability amplitudes. And probability amplitudes are complex numbers. And from this complex number, we can then retrieve the probabilities. Um, so one might think that this probability on each thing is superfluous and that just using probabilities is enough. But the probability amplitude uh, carries an additional information, which is essential for quantum computing. Uh, and uh, Quantum computing without these quantum numbers loses most of its power. Uh, so it's something that uh, I forgot to put the link here, but there is a paper which you can find which talks about this quantum computing uh, with just real numbers. Uh, and the way that we find the probabilities from these probability amplitudes is just to take the uh, squared modulus. So here, for example, I square root two over three. The, the squared model is just the conjugate, the complex conjugate of, the conjugate of that, which is minus I square root two over three, times the same number, so I square root over three. I times I is minus, minus times minus uh, is one. And uh, we find square root of two over three squared, which is just two over three, which indicates 66%. So this probability amplitude uh, formalism allows us to retrieve uh, what we observe, which are the probabilities, but it carries more information than that. And it's uh, it's not redundant or useless information, it's needed information. Uh, instead, instead of writing the column vector, we could just write it as a sum in this way. So here we, we write the, the probability amplitude times the uh, basis state vector uh, corresponding to that probability. It's amplitude. Both these notations are equivalent, and you can use the one that you feel uh, best. Uh, so to recap, the state of our system or of, of our quantum system is described by a column vector or like the, the sum. And to retrieve the probability of measuring in each state, we calculate the squared modulus. Uh, there is yet another way that we can represent the state vector instead of using com complex numbers alpha uh, and beta we can make use of the spherical coordinate variables theta and phi uh, so instead of alpha we write cosinus theta over two and instead of beta we write sinus uh, theta over two uh, times uh, exponential i phi so there is no uh, exponential here for a reason uh, for, for a mathematical reason, but uh, I will just uh, avoid going into these mathematical details. But this uh, is enough to describe our uh, two-bit system or our, uh, or our two-level system, the qubit. The point of this notation is, is that it allows us to represent the state of a quantum system inside a sphere uh, like this, the Bloch sphere. Uh, so here is what a representation of Bloch sphere look like. Here is the theta, that's theta, and here is the phi. Uh, so we write the state zero is at the, let's say the north pole, and the state one is at the south pole. 
And any uh, two-level quantum, uh, two-level uh, system, any qubit can be represented with this. And here there is a link to uh, a simulation of a block sphere in which you can play and you can see the, how the probability, uh, the measurement probability outcomes changes as you change the theta and the phi. Um, so this notation with the theta and the phi might look like uh, it has also more complexity uh, for no reason, but actually the block sphere uh, is a very nice visual and uh, intuitive way that allows you to understand what happens to a quantum system, or for example, to understand what a quantum algorithm do. So for example, here we have the mathematical expression of the quantum Fourier transform, so this expression, something that is essential for the famous Shor algorithm, uh, and which you might see if you study the Q-Silver course. Uh, so this expression, it looks quite complicated as is, uh, and it doesn't give you um, much insight of why it do what it does and uh, why does it do that. But with the block sphere representation, so here I, I preemptively introduced more qubits, but uh, you can get a sense of what the quantum Fourier transform does. So with the block sphere representation, you can see that the quantum Fourier transform is just a set of rotations on the x, y uh, plane, so this plane, uh, such, that, such that the QB3 uh, does pi over uh, pi rotation, the, the, the other one does pi over 2, pi over 4, and pi over 8. And this notation and representation can give you insight and facilitates the understanding of what happens to a quantum system or it can tell you what the quantum algorithm does. So here, if I had to add another qubit, uh, you will very easily understand that uh, the quantum theory basis, uh, it will be uh, a pi over uh, 16 rotation here, which is not very clear from just this notation. So uh, let's take a moment to recap uh, what we saw in this first part. Uh, as of now, I, I think that you should uh, have at least a vague idea about uh, what a superposition is. You should also know what uh, measurement is and how it affects our quantum system. Uh, you should know or uh, have an idea about what a qubit is. Uh, and finally, and more mathematically, you should be able to know what a state vector is and how to calculate the probabilities of measuring the quantum system in a particular state. Uh, if I had to give you the state vector describing that quantum system. So we'll take a moment to see if there is uh, any unclear part, or if there is a question concerning this first part about superposition, measurement, probabilities, state vectors. So if there is no question, we can uh, proceed. Yeah, for now, um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat or in the Discord, but. Uh... Okay, very helps as it was clear. If you have any questions, uh, you can just type them here in the Zoom chat. And uh, at every recap slide, I will feed them to Mohammed. So, okay, so I, I guess we can continue. Um, yeah, for now, yes, there are no questions that I can see. Um, uh, the quantum free yeah. transform, well, it will take too much time to explain it, sadly. It's part of the... Um, uh, it's part of the Q Silver course. So let's take uh, maybe a brief moment, or uh, I think it will take too much time to explain it, but this basis, it's used um, in sorry, order if, to uh, get an estimate. Yeah. If, if MK could ask this question on Discord, then we can get back to it later. So we can yeah, answer I think you, it would be uh, better. Because on the Zoom chat, yeah, the Zoom chat will go away. Also, we can provide more uh, better answers. Yes. Because it will take much time to just teach the QRT here. Yeah. Uh, so let's continue. Uh, I guess there is no other question. Okay, let's continue. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in, in the first part, uh, we saw that what a quantum system is and how to describe its state with the state vector. Let's now see how to modify the state by applying it. Uh, so in this part, I mainly focus on single qubit gates because we were just talking about single qubits. Uh, 
but later we will see how we use uh, multi-qubit gate. So the first gate that we look at is the X gate. So this gate uh, flips between the probability amplitude of the zero and one states. So uh, here, for example, uh, if you have initially alpha beta, you apply an X gate, you get a beta alpha. So it's quite uh, it's straightforward. Uh, visually, it just flips around the X axis. Here is the X axis. You make a flip and you go from one to zero, you would go from zero to one, uh, uh, and etc. cetera. Um, mathematically, the X gate and all the gates can be represented as matrices applied or multiplied uh, on the state vector. Uh, so the uh, X gate matrix is of the following form, uh, 0, 1, 1, 0. Uh, and you can check that uh, it does in fact uh, flip between uh, the two probability amplitudes. Uh, now let's see the Z gate. So this gate represents a flip around the Z, uh, the Z axis. So the Z axis is here. And when you take this state and you flip it, you will reach this. Uh, you can, it has this matrix representation. Uh, so it basically just changes the phase uh, of the system. Uh, now another gate which is very important, the Hadamard gate. Uh, the matrix representing this gate uh, is written here. Uh, and this gate is widely used to transform uh, the initial basis states into superposition state with equal probability. So this is, I think, what you were uh, doing in Cubrons and Unico. But let's try to visualize what the Hadamard gate does. For that, let's take uh, the state depicted on this block sphere. And uh, to understand what the Hadamard gate does, you will need to consider yourself looking at the block sphere from above such that the X axis is vertical to you. So you need to be looking at it top down and the X axis should be uh, vertical. So uh, here I just represent this with an eye. And if you take uh, this state and you look at, look at it top down, what you will see is this. And this is basically what the Hadamard gate, it transforms from this to this. So if you just look at the state, top down on the block sphere, you will have an idea about how your state will look like after applying the Hadamard gate. So uh, now uh, let's try with this state. So if you have people have pen and paper, you can try to um, draw how this state would look like after applying the Hadamard gates. So I will give you some moments, maybe a minute or two, uh, just to have uh, everyone try this. Uh, so I guess uh, this is enough time. Uh, well, if you apply the Hadamard gate uh, on this state, what you will see uh, is this. So basically you're looking top down, the arrow is going back this way. Uh, same thing for this, if you're doing the Hadamard gate on this, you see the X axis is what you see vertically and you will see the arrow points up. So from this uh, state, which is uh, one over square root of two, zero plus one, you will go to the zero state. Uh, and the same thing here, if you go from uh, one over square root of two, zero minus one, you will get this state. So this is like a, a simple trick to, uh, or intuitive visual trick to see what the Hadamard gate does. And I hope this uh, uh, helps you give an intuitive sense of what to do. Uh, now let's uh, look at the Rx, Ry, and Rz rotation gates. So these are gates that do uh, counterclockwise rotation around the X, the Y, and the Z axis. For example, the Rx gate, uh, here is the X axis. And when you do a counterclockwise rotation, you will follow this line. Uh, same thing, for example, here, here is the y axis, the IY gate, you're doing rotation this way. 
and for the Z, you're doing rotation this way. Uh, the angle of the rotation is a parameter that uh, you get to pick. Uh, so this is why the Rx, Ry, Rz, as well as some other gates are called parameterized gates. Uh, because the, the parameter here is the angle of the rotation, which you get to pick. Uh, so I put the link here of uh, more gates that you can find on Qiskit, and you can uh, basically look at more, more gates. So I will not be able to present all the gates. Uh, here are just the most uh, used, most famous gates that you'll see, but there is plenty of other gates that you can find. Uh, so, in the second part, we, we spoke a bit about gates, uh, and I expect you to be able to uh, answer these questions. So, you should be able to know what a parameterized gate is. Uh, you should know the x, y. So, here I didn't talk about the y, but x is a flip around the x axis, z is a flip around the z axis. So, it's easy to guess that y is a flip around the y axis. You should know what an H gate is and what it does, and that it's used for uh, going from uh, from basin states to equal superposition state, and it's widely used. Uh, Rx, Ry, Rz are also widely used, and uh, they represent rotations. And you should finally know, uh, given a state vector, if I tell you that I'm applying this case, you should be able to calculate the state vector after applying the case. So is there uh, any question, or is there something clear about this part? Uh, about the gates. Yeah, so far, uh, still no questions on Discord uh, on Zoom. So I just remind you, you can just um, type in your questions here on Zoom and uh, they will be answered by uh, Mohammed. Um, if there are, uh, let's say, big questions or if there are too many questions at some point, then we will uh, also answer them on Discord later. But feel free to use the uh, Zoom chat and also the live questions Discord channel. Okay, so I guess uh, no question. I can continue. Uh, so the last part is about uh, multiple qubits. Uh, so as of now, we were focusing on single qubits. We were considering that our classroom uh, was our quantum system for simplicity. Uh, but something that we said in the part one is that uh, we can consider the whole Q school as a one quantum system. We can study it. And in some sense, we can consider the whole world as a quantum system. We can also say this. For now, we will just focus on the Q school uh, for simplicity, obviously. So. Uh, in this case, the Q school will be our quantum system, the one which, which we study, and the classrooms will be subsystems uh, of the Q school. And each subsystem uh, is a qubit. So we will, in some sense, we have uh, one system composed of multiple qubits. Uh, at first, one might consider that uh, this generalization from one classroom to multiple classrooms, uh, which is from one qubit to multiple qubits, is trivial. Uh, but uh, it's not that hard, but there is a very important point uh, that we should be careful about that I will mention. Um, so to, to reach that point, uh, let's do another experiment. Uh, this time, let's consider multiple identical Q school, which all have two classrooms. And we'll consider that the state of this Q school is identical. And then we will carry uh, a series of measurements. So when we measure the first Q school, first classroom, second classroom, this is what we find. Uh, continuing measuring uh, the other identical Q schools, uh, this is what we get. Uh, so at the end, I have uh, three Q schools where the students are both sitting in the first, the second chair, and one Q school in which the student was found to be sitting in the first chair. Uh, so let's say if I keep doing this for a large number of times, I will get a 50% chance of having the student both sitting in the second chair, so the state, let's say, 1, 1, and 50% of the time having them both sitting on the first chair, the state, 0, 0. So 
Uh, let's try to think about how the state of this system, uh, how can we write the state of that system in a more formal way? Uh, so one might think that just using uh, these state vectors, so one state vector for the top classroom, one state vector for the bottom classroom is enough, as this would lead to us finding uh, half of the time the student sitting on first chair and half of the time the student sitting on the second chair, so each student. But uh, there is a crucial information that this uh, is lacking. So if we had to represent uh, this as our system, what we would in fact get is something along these lines. So half the time we'll have both the students, no, a uh, quarter of the time, both the students sitting on the first chair, and then half of the time sitting on different chairs, and a quarter of the time the students sitting on the second chair. So this is what these individual state vector indicate. But it's not the case that we found. What we found is that the measurement outcome of the first classroom is uh, the same as the measurement outcome of the second classroom. They are in some sense connected or uh, let's say entangled. So this is wrong. And uh, to represent the, the state of these measurement outcomes, something along these lines would be uh, more correct. So we will have a state vector for the whole uh, system and each entry of the state vector um, represent the measurement outcome of the whole system. So here one over square root of two, it means that the whole system was measured in the zero zero state, which means that both the students was measured sitting on the first chair. Here and here, it means that uh, the, both the students when we, we will never observe the students sitting on two different chairs. Uh, and here, if we calculate the probability, we'll find that half of the time both the students will be sitting on the, uh, the second chair. And one important thing to know is that no matter how you pick uh, individual, let's say, state vector one for each classroom, you will never be able to find such uh, a result, measurement result. So it's uh, fundamentally or it's uh, primordial that you take the, the state of the whole system and not just its constituents. Uh, and like that, such a system is called entangled because you, it cannot be described to its individual constituents. So you need uh, to take the whole system into consideration. Uh, so we will finish uh, this last part by talking about multi-qubit gates, uh, which are generally um, controlled gate, and we will more for, more specifically focus on the controlled knot. So the controlled knot or the C knot, for short, takes two qubit as an input, one which we will call control and which we will, one which we will call target. And it applies a not gate to the target gate if the control qubit, it is applied, sorry, uh, a not gate on the target qubit if the control qubit is in the state one. So uh, uh, this is what the thing does. As a reminder, this is what an X gate does. So it just flips, uh, it just flips the probabilities. Here it's very trivial, sorry. Here it's very trivial that uh, there is 100% probability that we find him in a state uh, zero. So the X gate just makes it 100% of finding him in the state uh, one. Uh, now let's uh, ask uh, the chat a question or a few questions. Uh, so given this definition, the C0 is applied if the control is in a state one and uh, otherwise nothing is done. So if we have such a system, which is basically zero, zero, and we apply C0, uh, what do you expect the, our system to become? So you can put your answers in the chat to see uh, if you understood. Same as the, you mean same as the input? 
zero zero. Um, this is correct. I guess we have made yeah same as the input indeed. Uh, and the reason is simple. Uh, when I forget to make a small precision here, I'm considering the top uh, classroom as being the, the control and the bottom as being the target. But indeed, uh, the, this is zero, so nothing is applied, and we will get uh, this, the the output will be the same as the input as the rehab and MK set. So. Uh, another question now, we will consider the control as being in the one state and the target being in the zero state and apply in a C naught. Uh, what do you expect uh, the system after this to be? In which state do you expect it to be in? One, 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 yes, correct. So basically here it's in the one state. So there is not getting applied on the second uh, qubit, which make it go to the uh, one state. And at the end we will have one one. Uh, now the more interesting part is when there is superposition. So we will consider that the top or the control qubit is in the one over square root of two, one over square root uh, state. And we apply C naught uh, and the question is, what will happen? Zero, zero plus one, one. Yes, more people. Zero, zero plus one, one. Uh, and this is correct. So we will have, uh, so, when so this is in a superposition of zero and one, and this is zero. This means that uh, we will have when this is zero, this will stay zero, but when this is one, this will become one, and we will have the entangled state that we just previously saw. So we will have the state in which half percent of the or uh, fifty percent of the time will have uh, zero zero state. And when we measure it, 50% of the time we have the zero zero state, and 50% of the time we have the one one state. So, and this is uh, an easy way to uh, create an entangled state. So, here you can reach this state with an H state. So, H C naught uh, gives you a very simple entangled state. Uh, so, in the last part, we spoke about what happens when we take more qubits into consideration. Uh, uh, we talked about entanglements, we talked about controlled gates, and more specifically the C naught. Uh, so, what I, what I expect you to be able to answer uh, is uh, to be able. So, this was seen from the first part what the quantum system is, but you should also know what the subsystem is. So, I hope this, is, this, this shouldn't be too hard. You should know what is entanglement. So, we talked about entangled state. Uh, you should know what uh, is the state vector of a system composed of multiple qubits. So how how is it written? Uh, you should know what say, is a control gate. So a control gate is a gate that gets applied when the target qubit is in the state one. Uh, you can have multiple target qubits. In fact, so you can have like a C controlled controlled not in which the not is applied if the first control and the second control are both in state one. Uh, and finally, you should be able to create a very basic entangled state, like the one that we saw here. So uh, the zero, zero plus one, one state. So um, this is the last part. Is there any question uh, that you have uh, about uh, this last part or about the talk in general? Um, since this is the last part, maybe if people just uh, want to unmute themselves and ask questions, so either on this uh, third part, part three, or on the whole thing, you can just go ahead since you have some minutes left. Of course, you're also free to write them down in the chat. Okay, so I guess there is no question. Uh, 
well, I hope that this uh, helped the, the audience and the people, uh, let's say, who, who are not familiar with quantum mechanics further, or let's say, understand the basics of quantum mechanics, and uh, especially the quantum mechanical concepts used in quantum uh, computing. Um, so this is going to be all for us. Uh, I hope that you liked today's session. If you have questions, you can ask us on Discord. So we'll be glad to answer you. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, see you soon, I guess, in 15 minutes, I guess, with the Womenium session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. I think, yes, uh, the next Womenium session should start in about 15 minutes. Um, if you want us to cover some specific topic, or um, if you want to have some another in, some interactive session where you can just ask questions, a Q and A, uh, you can just ask in in the Discord, or in, and we will take this into consideration for our next mentorship session. Uh, as I said earlier, if you still have questions uh, about this talk, you can uh, you can ask them in Discord. You can tag us, and we will answer you.